Good evening. Before we do anything at all, uh, I'd like to share that the University of Arizona sits on the traditional land of the Dona Autumn, who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. And we acknowledge this land as the foundation upon which our education is based on and from which it is informed. We are aligned with the university's core value of a diverse and inclusive community. It is our institutional responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up the Wildcat community. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Reyes Escudero, and I'm the Catherine B. Wallach Head of Special Collections. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to Special Collections, even though it is in virtual form. I can't wait um, to see you all in person soon, I hope. We are grateful for the partnerships between the University Libraries, Special Collections, and Dean and Professor Emerita Patricia McCorkadale to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the University of Arizona Department of Gender and Women's Studies. We're so excited for all of our panelists. I thank them for being gracious for their time and for allowing their and their fellow colleagues' efforts to be celebrated and acknowledged as they discuss where we've been, the work that has yet to be done and where we go from here. We love it when there's an opportunity for incorporating archives into the narrative or the story we're trying to tell. We ask everyone to please keep your mics muted and use the chat um, to ask your question. If your question is directed to a particular panelist, let us know in the chat. We're recording this event and the link to the recording will be posted on the Special Collections website. If you do not want to be part of the recording, please close your video and change your name in your Zoom screen. Now I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues, Erica Castaño and Mary Feeney, who along with Professor McCorkadale are co-curators of the online exhibition, Founding Mothers from the Ballot Box to the University. Erica Castaño is the Digital Initiatives Archivist and University of Arizona History Curator in the, in special, in the special Collections Department at the University of Arizona Libraries. She coordinates overall digital initiatives for us for making uh, archival materials available to the public and works with students and faculty in their research and teaching related to the history of the University of Arizona. Mary Feeney has been a librarian at the University of Arizona for over 20 years. She is the news uh, research specialist and, re and liaison librarian for gender and women's studies, history, journalism, and sociology at the libraries, where she partners with faculty and students in the, in the research, teaching, and learning. Thank you all for coming. Mary Feeney will now take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, and welcome to everyone. We're so glad to see you all here. 2020 marked the 45th anniversary of the formation of the Women's Studies Program at the University of Arizona. And we celebrate that moment in time while also acknowledging that there was a long journey of women speaking up for their rights to get to that point and a continuing journey since then. In our online exhibit that Veronica mentioned, Founding Mothers from the Ballot Box to the University, you can explore this journey through archival documents like what the Founding Mothers call the modest proposal for a women's studies program and through oral history interviews with some of these founding mothers, like Susan Phillips, Patricia McCorkadale, Judy Temple, Susan Aiken, Eliana Rivera, and Ruth Dickstein, who was the first women's studies librarian at the University of Arizona Libraries and a national leader in women's studies librarianship. This evening, we welcome our panelists who will discuss struggles of women faculty and the establishment of the UA Women's Studies Program, now the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. And we're really looking forward to the conversation with these women. So now I'll turn it over to Erica, who will introduce our moderator and panelists. Thank you, Mary. Um, tonight I have the great pleasure of, of sorry, there's a bit of technical bit. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, tonight I have the great pleasure of introducing our panel tonight um, with they're all distinguished faculty here at the University of Arizona. So I hope this will be a great um, conversation for us tonight. And leading our conversation is, and co-curator of this digital exhibit is Patricia McCorkadale. Patricia is Emerita Professor in Gender and Women's Studies and Dean Emerita of the Honors College. Trained as a sociologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, she studied the entry of women into traditionally male careers gender roles and sexuality and career aspirations 
of Arizona youth with attention to interest in science, technology, engineering, and math and STEM, otherwise known as STEM. An active feminist, she held fellowships in the Kellogg National Leadership Program and Tucson Public Voices. Her current research focuses on the history of the founding of the University of Arizona Department of Gender and Women's Studies. Next, we have Professor Eliana Rivero. She is Professor Emerita of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Arizona, where she was also adjunct professor of women's studies and affiliate faculty in the, the Mexican American and Latin American studies programs until her retirement in 2011. R Rivero has done scholarly work and teaching in the area of Hispanic and Latin American and US Latinx literature, especially poetry and women's writing for over 55 years. She has published eight books. She has lectured widely in um, in the US and abroad, and was the first Latina humanist to be named Phi Beta Kappa, uh, and is a distinguished scholar in 2000 to 2001. Next, we have Judy Temple. Judy Nolte Temple was head of the Women's Studies from 1995 to 1998, bringing it to departmental status during her tenure. Temple came to the University of Arizona in 1981 to help direct curriculum integration project funded by the NEH. The project's goal was to assist faculty in including information by and about women into their classes and research. The book that emerged from the project was called Changing Our Minds, Feminist Transformations of Knowledge, which was co-edited which was co with several women's studies affiliates. Temple's own research focuses on early women diaries, including those she studied in New, New Zealand, as well as a Fulbright scholar. And finally, tonight we have the current chair, uh, the current department head for um, gender and women's studies, Dr. Stephanie Troutman Robbins. She's a black feminist scholar, mother, and first generation college student. She is department head for gender and women's studies at the University of Arizona, and she is Associate Professor of Emerging Literacies in Rhetoric Composition in the Teaching of English. She is formerly affiliated faculty member in Africana Studies, Teaching and Learning and Social, and Social Cultural Studies, Africana Studies, and the LGBT Institute. She received her dual PhD in Curriculum and Instruction and Women's Studies from Pennsylvania State University in 2011. And with that, I want to hand it over to Patricia so we can start our um, panel tonight. Thank you, Erica. I'd like to remind everyone that if you have questions, please put your questions into the chat function and we hope to leave plenty of room for questions at the end. My plan for this, this evening's panel um, is to have two rounds of questions with each participant. Um, and I will be monitoring the time so that we have a chance to hear from everyone. So I don't mean to be rude and cutting people off, but that's part of my responsibility is to make sure that we move along. We're going to be starting with Eliana Rivero. Eliana, do you want to turn your mic on? Yeah, there you go. Okay. So Eliana, you revived, arrived at the University of Arizona in 1967, one of the first women faculty here. So how did you find the women to advise and support you in those early years? Well, when I arrived in my department, it was Romance languages. Later, it became Spanish and Portuguese. There were two women there, and one was retired and was teaching from home one seminar per semester. So I didn't have a lot of colleagues that were female. Um, so I said to myself, I better join some women's uh, club or organization. And then I went to the faculty women's club. Turns out it was a faculty wives club. When I entered the room in the student union, when they were meeting, they asked me, what does, where does your husband teach? And I said, no, I'm the professor. And there was a wow, wow, uh, amazed look on, on their faces. 
1968, another woman came into my department, my Brazilian colleague, and we shared an office for many years. I'm grateful to her because she taught me how to speak Portuguese. <laughs> but it wasn't until 1970, three years later, that I met Shirley Fahey. I heard that she had been hired as assistant professor of psychiatry at the College of Medicine, and uh, she was filing a lawsuit for discrimination um, against the state practice of requiring women when they were applying for a credit card to have a man sign the application, whether a father or a husband. Um, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous today, but that was the law then. Um, uh, Joan Rosenblatt, who was the wife of Paul Rosenblatt, professor of English in 1972, had joined Shirley in that lawsuit. And I was very grateful to them. I looked them up because I had been able to walk into a bank in Tucson and apply for a credit card. And they did not ask me for my husband's signature. So that was a big battle. Um, the three of us began to meet weekly. And in 1972, we had other women uh, join us. Uh, two of the most distinguished names from that um, time were uh, Myra Dinnerstein, who was for years the face of women's studies. She had uh, been brought to the university as a spousal hire in the history department. Um, her husband was a professor of history. And the other important member of those days was uh, Professor uh, Laura Wilkening, who was an astro, uh, a professor of planetary sciences. Um, all these women, we gathered together, we were meeting, and then so we formed what we were called Committee on the Status of University Women, or CUS, CSUW, and, and Laurel and Myra were very important members of that. Um, in those days, believe me, it was very difficult to get data, to get uh, to get the university administration to tell us anything about were they being inclusive? How about salary equity? We didn't know what was the comparison between men and women. And it was a blessing for us to have Laurel, who was a scientist, because the president of the university then was the scientist, John Schaefer, and so was the provost, uh, Al Weaver. And so Laurel and her credentials had more credibility with the administration that we the humanists did. And um, uh, finally, we got some data and we saw that women were indeed being paid a lot less than men. Uh, and then so that's how we started. That's how we started uh, in 1972. And I believe that one of the first acts of the Commission on the Status of University Women was also to investigate starting a women's studies program. And that's where that modest proposal comes from, is from that work as well. Did, did you um, benefit from the salary equity? Did they give women raises back in that first round when they discovered that there were pay gaps? <laughs> it was hard. I actually was part of one of the committees in my college that studied uh, with, uh, salary equity. Uh, but I had my own personal struggle with that because I had my own tenure fight. Um, I came up for tenure in 1973 and I was what, uh, the dean wanted to deny me tenure, even though the department recommended, because uh, they didn't think that Latin American studies were anything important to speak of. And also, there were not very many women in the field. So uh, when that happened, and they gave tenure to a male colleague who had less publications and um, Let's face it, I had two books by then and he didn't have any in print yet. Uh, and then so I filed um, a complaint, a formal complaint with the Civil Rights Office of the Equal Employment Opportunity. They came and they investigated and they gave me the right to sue them. And then that was when they gave me tenure, They had, I have been demoted to lecture. They promoted me to associate professor with tenure and they raised my salary $10,000 at which some men in my department complained. Okay, I'm going to stop you there, Eliana, and we're going to move on to Judy, but we'll come back to you in just a few minutes. Okay. So, Judy, I wanted to um, start by talking about how I first met you when we had a curriculum integration project together uh, with many other of our women faculty to help men modify their courses to include materials on women. And we decided on having this project because we knew that there were very few women faculty 
had any interest in gender that were teaching and we wouldn't be able to reach very many students. And when we surveyed students, we found out that they reported that nearly all of their courses had no materials about women or by women. So I'd like to ask you about when you came to the university in 1981 to direct this project, what were the challenges and opportunities that you encountered? Thank you, Pat. Uh, it was amazing to come here because the same energy and complaints that the students had here had occurred at the University of Iowa, where I had been. Uh, a student asked in a large American literature class why the syllabus had no writings by women. And the professor proudly said, because no woman has ever written anything of merit. And that was that. And so students more and more were requesting this. And so there was this, this huge need. So the structure of the project was that we basically took about 10 tenured faculty members each summer, paid them what they would usually get for teaching uh, summer school, but they were actually learning from us. And we had readings. Uh, we eventually asked them to design a syllabus. We would go in and look at their teaching. Uh, one of the things that really helped us, because we were junior and they were all tenured, was that we brought in very esteemed feminist scholars like Linda Kerber, who was president of national organizations, to say things like, what? You haven't read that work? That's cutting edge. And so that really helped us. But in your wonderfully archived uh, collection, there are pictures of us and how young we looked compared to the faculty that we were, we were leading. So the resistance was amazing. The faculty said, well, if I have to add something, what will I cut? Uh, they were worried about how would they shoehorn something in. And so can I talk about the successes and some of our failures? Well, uh, I went back and looked at our essay in the book that was mentioned, which is called Changing Our Minds. And in the last word, a section, we talked about the challenges. And uh, we found that about a fourth of our participants had substantial change, really did change their minds, uh, look at different perspectives, start to talk about critical race theory, all of these things that were uh, being respected in the academy. Another fourth did add materials, but I love it. We called them add, but don't stir. All right, so they did what they had to do, but they really weren't going to change their mind. And then the other half just stayed kind of resistant. I remember one time when we were discussing biology and one of the male professors said, but it is biology, the stallion, he circles his mares, he is dominant, you can't do anything about biology. So it, it, those were different, different, difficult times, I would say. But we were intellectually curious. We got men whose own wives and daughters had experienced sexism, and they were willing to change because we were doing interesting intellectual work. Okay. Um, so I think you touched on the power dynamics between the women and the men and what the characteristics were. What about the long-term effects of the project? How did doing the project end up influencing women's studies trajectory on campus? That's an excellent question. I think what happened is our colleagues learned that we were very smart. They were interested in interdisciplinary work, which is what brought many of them to our project, that they were finding limitations within their own department and they could see the benefit of this. And so I think that because they respected us and because we were networked and they were now talking to their colleagues about us and were amazed at the volume of new scholarship that was out by and about women, that I, th I think it did give impetus to our later becoming a department. Okay. Great, thank you. Now we'll turn to Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, you're the current head of Gender and Women's Studies. And as people will note, the program changed its name from Women's Studies to Gender and Women's Studies in 2009. In recognition, I think of the complexity of gender 
in our thinking and also the growth in LGBTQ studies. So Stephanie, I thought you could start by talking a little bit about the current areas of interest in the department now and how those re reflect both a tie into the past, but then also more recent developments in the field. Uh, thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I'll just start by saying, you know, um, having this intergenerational dialogue and this platform, this opportunity, I think is really important. So thank you for, you know, organizing it. And, uh, you know, it occurs to me that Ileana talks about retiring in 2011, and that's when I got my PhD in women's studies and, <laughs> and curriculum and instruction. And so I'm celebrating the 10 years uh, from getting my PhD uh, that's coming up this spring. Um, and it's even in, this, in that time period in the last decade, we've seen many changes. When I left my program, it was still women's studies at Penn State. And in, within the last few years, it was changed to women, gender, sexuality studies. And so I think a lot of, I've been involved um, for many years with the National Women's Studies Association. And I think that, um, you know, being able to track the changes. And I think that at the time when I was doing my uh, degree, my PhD in women's studies, we still, we were talking about a lot about transnational feminism, global feminism. We were talking a lot about um, political economy and a lot about feminist Marxism and, and different issues like that. And there's definitely an emphasis on gender, but not, uh, and on sexuality, but I definitely have seen more LGBTQ studies and specifically trans studies as very become very central to the field in the last several years. So I, I feel that even though it hasn't been that long since I've gone through my training, that that wasn't part of it, right? So that's sort of where, where you know, this commitment to being a scholar in the field of gender and women's studies means that we have to continue to grow also in terms of being lifelong learners and really prioritizing the kinds of things that are, you know, emerging. And that's the thing I love about the field is that, you know, there, there is always something emerging that's new, that's cutting edge, that's really relevant and really important in terms of what's happening globally, what's happening socially, and definitely lots of cultural production. And so uh, that's been a really exciting, it's been an exciting time to be in the field. And so I think for myself, thinking about some of the historical struggles, women's studies uh, and gender and women's studies, it's, um, it's always a smaller major, right, um, in terms of undergraduate interest. We're more of a discovery major. And so that's something that you know, any women's studies program I've been a part of, um, that's been an issue that's discussed pretty, pretty regularly. Um, and at the National Women's Studies Association level as well, coming together with other heads and directors from uh, programs and departments around the country, you know, some places don't even have a department, they still have a program, um, right? Some, some places are merged together with ethnic studies or critical studies. And so just kind of uh, thinking about and women's studies as a unique, we still have a unique space in the academy. So even though it's, it hasn't been long since many of the departments have been established, I think they've always and continue to struggle for status, for funding, for recognition. And we're often acknowledged for some of the great work that our scholars are doing. We're all, most of us are interdisciplinary. Um, and so we're producing work that is in gender and women's studies that shapes the field and that is the field, but also producing work that's counted or looked at in psychology or history or the many, you know, humanities and different places. So, I mean, that's, that's always exciting and that's great. And I think it's often our contributions that move those other fields forward. I don't think we get enough credit for that. I think that um, as Judy's pointing out, you know, we know that there are folks who are not even thinking about those things or looking at those things and along comes, you know, a feminist geographer or a feminist psychologist. And suddenly these, these other fields are now benefiting and growing and starting to talk about trans issues or LGBTQ identities and feminist theory um, because of our contributions. And so I think that while our own departments might remain small or underappreciated, that really there's additional recognition that we deserve and that, you know, we need to sort of be part of that discourse of amplifying the way in which not only we've shaped this field, but that our contributions are shaping and moving other fields forward. 
Yeah, I think that's really true that the recognition needs to be there and it isn't always there, but at least it's a department and a recognized academic field, which we had to fight really hard for. They didn't think that we were going to be a department right. and that we would have that, you know, with that we were a legitimate field for a long time. So even though uh, GWS is a small department now, I think it does make important contributions. So we're going to start on our second round of questions now, and I'm going to go next to Aliana. And Eliana, I, um, need, you need to unmute your microphone. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned before about how you had to struggle to get tenure because you didn't get it until you ended up suing the university. But one story that I know that you shared with me was the university's reaction when the EEOC, which is the um, Equal Opportunity um, Employment Commission, um, when they said that you had the right to sue and that you had been discriminated on the basis of gender, and, uh, on sex and, um, and, um, and race, ethnicity, um, the university responded to you. And I wish you, I hope you can share with us the, how they responded, because I think that's an important story. Yes, yes. Um, I am chock full of anecdotes, but this is a good one. <laughs> Uh, in 1974, when I was finally promoted to associate professor with tenure, and I was given that race, et cetera, to bring me to the level of, of my the male colleagues. Um, the then uh, dean, when I presented my, my grievance against the university, he was dismissed. He was not dean anymore. And then uh, Paul Rosenblatt, uh, Hus Joan's husband, who had been in the group with us, uh, he was professor of English, but he was interim professor, uh, sorry, interim head of Spanish and Portuguese, and then he became dean. And when that whole thing finished and they finally promoted me, he called me into his office and he said, Why they, what they did to you was outrageous. And then that was, apparently he spoke to the higher administration and he expressed his feelings. And, and then the whole situation was, was changed. But I would like to mention something also that it was the reaction of men, of male colleagues to the uh, beginning of women's studies in 1975. I had literally two colleagues that came uh, and talked to me coming, uh, walking down the hall and one colleague said, women's studies, why women's studies? Why not men's studies? And I said, everything is men's studies. And he just continued walking, you know. And another person came to me, he was my friend and he said, Ellie, that's my nickname, Ellie, don't do this feminist stuff. It's going to hurt you in the end. Don't do that. This feminist stuff is not, you know, we don't, we don't want to hear too much of that. That's the truth. And <laughs> finally, um, uh, the reactions later, these men that had protested in a sense, they ended up taking the curriculum integration seminars uh, due to the NEH grant that women's studies got. So I think that they finally included women in their courses. I was lucky that I had been able to teach the first course on, on women, on women in, in literature in Latin America in 1978. But I'll have you know, this is another uh, anecdote. Uh, a colleague complained that I had studied um, the famous uh, Mexican author Rosario Castellanos, and she has some feminist poetry in which she mentions the word semen. And he objected to my using those texts in class because they included the word semen. Can you believe that? It was 1975. And the last anecdote is when women's studies was giving an office in the mathematics building, there were not any facilities for women to go to the bathroom. Everything was men bathrooms. And then so on the floor that they gave us the office for women's studies, they had a bathroom that used to be men's and they gave it to us. And guess what happened? Some of the younger people, I, I guess they were uh, teaching assistants, they got into the women's bathrooms and they got underneath the doors of the stalls and they locked all the stalls so we couldn't use the bathrooms. Those were the days, guys. Those were the days. <laughs> but but we, we, we conquered. 
Yeah. I think that the I think that story is really important about the facilities and and the microaggressions. We didn't have that word back then. Right. Um, we knew that people did things to make us uncomfortable, telling us we weren't a real field. We shouldn't study the things that we did. Um, but I think that those helped us. Those all those things, you know, made us feel that we were fighting to have a place in the academy and that our relationships with each other were really important. Thank you. So. Yeah, so I'm going to move on finally next to Judy. So Judy, you were the department head when women's studies um, switched from being a program to being a department. And um, I hope you can share with us some of the strategy and the challenges that that presented uh, to make that move because it was such an important milestone for the department. Well, we had actually been trying to become a department since the early 1990s, but it was always something, as Gilda Radner would say. Uh, we already had a, a small core faculty, which could be tenured, but the tenure home had to be in a different department. And we had a huge number of affiliates. So these were faculty who cross-listed our courses. But the problem with that is that our department head had to then go seek and find and see if Eliana could cross list, could somebody else cross list that semester. So the head before me, Karen Anderson said, I am tired of being reliant on the kindness of strangers. We've got to try again to become a department. Meanwhile, uh, we had undergone an annual program review and we were listed as one of the top 15 programs in the whole United States. So that really, really helped us. Um, we had gone through all these hoops before. Undergraduate council liked us. The graduate council did not approve our application for department. And supposedly someone against us said, why don't those feminists just go off campus somewhere and become a center? And my response was, the center is usually as far from the center as it can be. You're just trying to get rid of us. Uh, so our, our main champion was Paul Seifert, who took this to the Board of Regents nonetheless. But he was looking at a very strong association for women faculty and our magnificent WOSAC, Women's Studies Advisory Committee, that Myra had started in the mid-1980s and very powerful women wanted women's studies to become a department. So I would like to read from you from my diary for that day, February 13th, 1997. Well, women's studies is a department. It was over in a flash. At 1030, Esther Capen gave an eloquent statement on our behalf saying that if we were an athletic D team in the top 15 nationally, U of A would be proud. Eddie Basha beamed. Then at 3.30, Dorothy Finley spoke. She had completely changed the agenda so because she was in a hurry. Paul Seifert spoke vaguely about pioneer women. John Munger suggested general gender studies, and it was unanimous vote, lots of hugging. So that was a, a very triumphant moment. Um, we... So let me just add in that Esther Capen was a woman who was a regent at the time, and Dorothy Finley was the person who, uh, with um, some other women in um, Marilyn Hines, Marilyn Hines started um, the WOSAC, the Women's Studies Advisory Council. And Dorothy was a, a prominent businesswoman, so there were a lot of, of people really far behind this. Uh, one compromise uh, was that we were told very heavily that we would have to order our books not only from the feminist woman-owned bookstore Antigone, but we should include our book lists at the company store, the U of A bookstore. And that was unfortunate for Antigone to, to do that. And uh, when you become a department, there are different rules and it was harder for our affiliates to be active. So there are, are trade-offs and, and what we achieved, although we were very proud of doing it. Well, thank you, Judy, for sharing that about the, um, about the transition to becoming a, a department. And next, we'll go back to uh, Stephanie and speak with her again. Um, and, you know, 
Stephanie, Black women feminists have contributed greatly to women's studies scholarship, popular culture, the arts, very prominent these days in politics. And I'm hoping that you can share with us your experience as a Black woman, woman and until recently, a single mother. What's it been like for you in the academy and, um, and what is it like in women's studies in particular? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting historically. I mean, we're in this moment where I think some of the kinds of things that happen in the past around women and gender studies and getting folks to add to their curriculum and to their syllabi, we're seeing similar things happening now around critical race theory and race studies and a lot of um, response to the movement for racial justice. Um, something that a lot of feminists have been involved in for a very long time. Um, Black feminists in particular doing work around abolition and rethinking prisons. And, you know, that that's been on the agenda of, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Angela Davis and Andrea Ritchie, many people for, for a long time, Black women feminists. So we're really seeing that though, um, we're really seeing more of their work and more discourse both in and outside the academy around those kinds of issues. And some of the other contributions that I think, you know, are important. It's important to note that, you know, Black Lives Matter, that the, you know, that that's a movement that, yes, it's global, it's national, but, you know, started by three Black queer feminist women who very much, you know, align themselves with Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks and the Kambahi River Collective and other Black feminists who, you know, have, have been around for a while. And I think um, also the popularity of intersectionality, um, whether it's used correctly or not, and if it's overused or misused, is a conversation for another time. But <laughs> I think, you know, I've, I'm seeing and hearing that everywhere in popular discourse, in all these places. It's very important to me always to tie it back to Kimberly Crenshaw and critical race theory and critical race feminism and black feminism. So I think, you know, we're seeing these, um, we're seeing this movement over time. And I also, when I have the opportunity to connect all the way back even further to Sojourner Truth, uh, kind of talking about her race and her status as a woman at Seneca Falls, right? So even though we know that black women were not included, um, they've been there all along. And really what she was talking about in that speech is what, is what can't, kind of has, you know, came to be known as intersectionality, right? This, I'm Black, but I'm also a woman. And yet, you know, like, what about me? How do I fit into this, right? And so I think um, for me, even though others have, I'm the first chair of the department to have a PhD in women and gender studies, which again speaks back to what you were talking about, Judy, that there just, it wasn't established, right, as a department in which one could get a graduate degree. So I feel very fortunate that, you know, my training allowed me to have it um, be the focus of my PhD studies. Um, and I, I guess saying all that is just to sort of say that anytime um, it came up along the way that like, oh, you know, Black women have been excluded and have been mistreated, um, always told to wait, right, for their issues behind white feminist issues, things like that. It's also the case that Black women were still organizing and working and claiming feminism and, you know, being part of that conversation, maybe, in mar maybe on the margins, maybe in doing some of their own things outside of mainstream feminism, but we've been there all the while. And so I've always sort of connected to and claimed those histories that I know about um, as a way to sort of, you know, anchor myself. And I think, you know, as a Black woman in the academy, we're hearing from Ileana talking about her struggles to get tenure and to be recognized. And I think for myself, you know, um, being a single mother uh, at the time when I was going through grad school with two young children, it was difficult. I mean, there were people that said like, why are you here? Like you have a baby, you have a three-year-old, you're single, like you're never gonna be able to do a PhD program. And so um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm just stubborn. But uh, so the more people said that, you know, the more determined it actually kind of made me to be like, no, and I'm gonna finish in five years, just like everyone else. And 
my advisor was like, well, most people don't finish a dual PhD in five years, even without kids, but <laughs> okay. Like if it's what you want to do, let's, let's do it. And so, you know, I just pushed through, but I, I did, I will have to say I had support in ways that, that don't exist here. And um, what I mean by that is I had, I had childcare on campus that was available to me um, at Penn state and they have an excellent uh, childcare program. They have multiple, uh, you know, spaces for children, um, and that made it possible in ways that it just wouldn't be possible at some place like the U of A, where they don't support families in that way. And I think that as a Black woman, of course, I face the microaggressions and the many other things. But um, yeah, I, we, we can move on. <laughs> but yes, there's there's definitely um, been struggles. I think it's so. In, I think it's so interesting that. The university has this policy that it doesn't want to compete with private businesses. So for years, the Association for Faculty Women struggled to try and get child care on campus. And we were always told, well, there is child care that's available in the commercial world and we can't compete with them because that wouldn't be fair. But then on other in other situations, you know, we do have things like we have our bookstore bookstore on campus and that's important. And it is important and supports the university. So it's interesting how those decisions are made about what things are okay and what things aren't. Um, I remember when I was acting head, some people came from uh, Texas Women's University uh, to look at the campus and they came to me, I had lunch with them and they said, well, we couldn't find your childcare um, facilities on campus. Where are they? Are they here in the student union? I said, no, we don't have them. They said, oh, are they in the library? I said, no, we don't have them. They said, oh, are they in the rec center? I said, no, we don't have them. And they went, you don't have them? So it's been a long struggle and that's one that we haven't won. I think it's time for us to move to the questions from the audience. And so um, we'll um, ask Mary Feeney and um, Erica Castaño uh, to join us because they're going to be handling the questions. Well, we have a, a comment um, that, so that maybe might spark some more discussion. The Eliana reminds me, this is from uh, Sid Sidoni Smith. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Eliana reminds me of how important the Ford Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities were with their programs to advance feminist studies and curricular transformation. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. And she also said that another important moment for the activist women scholars was the appointment of Laurel Wilkening as Dean of Sciences. I can speak to the first point. Hi, Sid. It's great to see you. Sid was another of our colleagues and beloved first women faculty on campus. And I well, I remember when uh, Women's Studies applied for a grant from the Ford Foundation, which was very important. And my anecdote, I'm full of them, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my anecdote in that concerns the officer that came from Washington, D.C. to interview faculty and to interview people that were associated with Women's Studies. And then I remember uh, Myra and Janice Monk uh, from um, uh, Ciro were uh, outside and they say, come in, come in, come in, come into the room. And that woman, she was a woman officer from the Ford Foundation was in the interview room by a table. And so I enter, I close the door and she looks at me and she says, you're Eliana? I says, you're Latina? How come you look so white? Can you imagine? The four foundation officers said that to me, of course, totally confusing race with ethnicity. <laughs> well, that's one anecdote, but we got the grant and it was great and wonderful. And also Sid mentioned, of course, um, the NEH, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When the curriculum integration program that I mentioned before, because some of my colleagues that were not too sold on the idea of women's studies, but then they, they, they applied and they were, kind of like convinced, you know, that they had to really uh, include women in their courses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those were the days, indeed. Well, I think, that the, I, think that the, I think that those grants are really important because they um, brought money into the university and obviously that matters. You know, the university cares about research dollars being brought in and that shows that the scholarship is legitimate, somebody else is funding it. So that really helped the field. Um, and women's studies um, started 
um, with the Rockefeller Foundation grant, the um, Southwest Institute for Research on Women, which still exists today um, and does a lot of community outreach as well as program evaluation and looks at a lot of important issues and makes advances in the community. And I think that was something that really helped us was being able to have the, those outside sources of funds to help with the issue of legitimacy. So I think that the dollars were important in that way too. And the curriculum integration movement that, um, that Judy directed, you know, we started just doing uh, the humanities with that grant from the NEH, uh, but then we went on to do a regional project that covered 17 Western states. Uh, we did a project on international issues that had people integrating women stuff into a global perspective. Uh, we had a project on uh, women of color. Um, so there was a whole series and iteration of those different projects that were funded by different sources, um, but also helped to bring in other departments into the conversation. So I think that those were all really important. I would like I to add one point uh, that there was a childcare facility in, on campus many years ago, and it didn't do well. And finally, it was taken over by a fraternity. Thank you building it was on first street and 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 cherry i think yeah stephanie oh i was just going to say to the point about the grants i think you know i would love to use it as an opportunity to amplify our one of our current faculty members Darius carter um dr carter just received an neh one of three in the state of arizona um, and the first, the only one at the U of A in this particular cycle um, for work that uh, he's doing on black exploitation. Um, and so we're very uh, proud of him and very excited for that work. And, um, you know, also this, the Ford Foundation not only um, kind of seeded grants at different institutions for women's studies, for the development of women's studies projects, but also at the national level, you know, uh, Ford Foundation grants have made possible, you know, women of color, um, kind of like academic boot camps and, you know, a summer school at Spelman for black women feminists and also helped produce documents um, through different researcher, women studies researchers in different parts of the country to establish guidelines for tenure and promotion um, for the field. And so a lot of white papers and other kinds of research and important kind of policy and academic um, procedural work has been done through those grants as well. And so we have these different things that help us, you know, maintain a particular status in, in our academic spaces. And so the grants have been important in those ways too. I think that some of the challenges though that were faced back, you know, when women's studies was a program and becoming a department are still, are still pertinent today, especially in this, you know, COVID and fiscal kind of crisis and, you know, these different times of budget austerity and other things that have happened, especially with the state of Arizona defunding education at all levels, including higher ed, oftentimes that translates into. So we have, a, um, thank you both. We have a, um, another question. This is from Ashley. And this is a great question uh, that any of you could answer. All of you could. What advice can you offer for young female scholars who face similar yet different challenges and barriers that you have faced? Who'd like to start that? Judy? <laughs> well, I think, I think that I think a, very Stephanie's important, a very important part of uh, is not feeling alone, getting together with other young women that are in the same situation, even if it's just to have coffee. It just uh, gives you that sense of solidarity and sisterhood and the idea that you're not only not alone, but that you're doing something that matters. I think that's that's very important. I think another thing that's important is that we are getting more and more feminist faculty uh, in departments, and so students have some place to go. Uh, one of the participants in our integration grant said, 
I had always just thought the female graduate students' complaints were were isolated, but now I can see that there can be systematic racism, sexism. I'm beginning to support them more, understand them more, intervene. So I think when you have a, a critical mass, that that really begins to change the academy. I mean, I would um, just say, you know, yes, like we're still struggling. Um, and so it might not be the struggle of the inaccessible bathrooms or people saying to our face, oh, like, why are you doing that? Or don't mess around with feminism or women's studies isn't a real field, you know, but there's still a lot of the, those sentiments, right? Oftentimes, for example, if I'm in particular spaces on campus where we're talking about department issues or budget issues, and smaller units and things like this, people will often say, well, the smaller units like gender women's studies, you know, like point to that as sort of, it's always the go-to as it's the small department or, you know, and it's, and there's this uh, somewhat of a negative context around that. And um, so there's still these things that come up that have to be dealt with. And I think as a woman of color scholar, you know, my tenure process here, um, I wasn't denied tenure, um, but I definitely know that my process was different from some of the, the colleagues. Um, my, I was tenured in the English department, and um, I know that colleagues in the English department were not asked for some of the same kinds of materials and uh, information that I was required to include with my uh, dossier, for example, right? And so I think it's really important that that we um, are honest about these things, that we share these things, because if we don't, then um, folks will, will think that like, oh, well, that was then, or that, you know, this is not going on now. And it's like very important to say, no, these instances still happen. There's still misunderstandings about what, what exactly it is that we do. Um, but I do think to your point, Judy, we do have more feminist scholars. We have a lot of folks who are getting, um, who, do, who have done a graduate certificate maybe in GWS or who have minored in GWS at the graduate level. Um, we're getting scholars who, like me, have PhDs in, G in GWS, right? So I think that, you know, we are having more people spread out across departments, even if they're not directly centered in GWS, but the, the problems and some of the issues are definitely still there. I think it's still hard for women to get full professor. If we look at numbers around full professor, if we look at women deans, if we look at some of those kind of metrics, we definitely see that we're still we're still behind in those areas due to systemic issues. Um, there's still sexual harassment, right? Like there are things that that don't that kind of persist, and um, it's very important that we, I think, a tell the truth about that, and b, you know, form alliances so that we can support each other. I was going to say, as part of this project, it was interesting to see that the progress we have made, you know, that we have come a long way and that some steps that we've taken are really important and we're not going back on those. But it was also disheartening to see that many of the issues that we faced then are still being faced today. You know, gender pay inequity, um, problems with promotion and tenure, not enough women represented, not enough women of color. So some of the issues show us that there's still work that needs to be done. Um, and so that just means we have to, I think, roll up our sleeves and keep on working on the issues that we've been working on for a long time. Um, so, um, so we have to continue those fights. Um, and, you know, the women from the past as well as the present can, you know, you know, be allies to each other and to help in those processes too. So we have time for just a couple of more questions. So I wanted to go on to the next question from Sadie, and that is, how has the status of the department within the greater university um, shifted recently? It, is there still some sense of GWS as not being a quote unquote real field among the other um, academics? I don't think that there's necessarily, I think we're respected as a field, but I think we, um, our national, again, National Science Association, um, you know, has done a lot of work um, in the last decade, the last 15 years to really make sure that um, departments and programs are, are respected um, and the knowledge that we produce and the scholarship that comes out of our field. So I think that that's not as much of an issue as some of the ways in which gender and women's studies units are really never going to fit into the sort of neoliberal logics of the institution at this moment. 
right? So I think the fight to institute these things and bring them into the institution um, historically was really a pushback on women and on women's issues and trying to sort of keep women, you know, in their place, et cetera, in all aspects of society, right? And then I think that once we overcame some of that and we were able to establish programs and departments, now it becomes more about like, well, as we deal with the neoliberal and corporate institution, uh, institutionalization of higher ed, now what does that mean to the project that is gender and women's studies? And I think that that's where our new kind of struggle or battleground uh, takes place on that. As we're trying to push back and say, we want more women of color, we want trans faculty, we want to talk about these other kinds of politics and issues, we want to push back on the university for doing things, right, that are degrading the environment or that are not aligned with other kinds of important social justice issues. We want to advocate for our students, right? And so I think that the struggles uh, now are more along those lines, uh, not so much as challenging us as a field. Let me add to that. I think the wisdom of Myra Dinnerstein in getting a community support group that has uh, financial, um, very great, powerful voices was just prescient that she did that. Uh, as she said to Marilyn Hines, I guess, um, Women's Studies doesn't want to hold a bake sale. We've got to do something better than this. And behind me, you see the Women's Plaza of Honor, which opened officially in 2005, which raises scholarships. So I think the more uh, bases that we have are uh, research grants, WOSAC, all of these things together gives us the best foundation to have diverse sources of power. So I think with that, we have, we might have one more time for a question or we wanna wrap it up here. Well, we have a few more outstanding questions. So I guess it depends on um, if people but wanna- <laughs> If you're willing to stay, we're willing to stay. Yeah. So let's at least take, take one more. Okay, great. So the next is from um, Teresa. And Teresa's question is, I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts on gender studies scholars moving into leadership positions in the university. Has this happened often? Is the field respected in that, is the field respected in that way? Well, I can speak to the fact that I became Dean of the Honors College um, in 1993 and held that role for a really long time, overseeing it from being a, a, a program to becoming a college. So I was the founding Dean. Um, Laura Wilkening, who was mentioned before, started in the Lunar and Planetary Lab, um, became a vice a president or became an administrator, vice president, I think. Um, for research and graduate education. Uh, she moved on to become a chancellor at the University of California. Um, and she was definitely a feminist scientist who was, a, um, who was very committed to women's studies. So I think that it's definitely possible for people to move into leadership positions. Uh, Monica Casper, who was a former department head in gender and women's studies, moved on to become an associate dean in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and now has moved to uh, university at, California State University, San Diego, I believe, um, as a dean there. So there's definitely um, people are able to move into other positions um, and have leadership um, in their universities. And you can see that, I think, across the board at different kinds of universities. So I think that um, that does show the status of the field, um, that people are able to have leadership positions. Well, I think we might wrap it up now. I, I actually want to pull one of the comments. It's not a yes. question, but I because you all probably aren't seeing the chat, our panelists, um, from Spike, who said that she uh, wants to say how, mu how much I deeply appreciate this event and the women and men who have made women's studies, gender and women's studies, and ILGBT possible through such inspired and dedicated work in spite of so much resistance. So thank you sincerely. Um, to Patricia, Eliana, Judy, Stephanie, we really appreciate you being here. What a wonderful program. Um, I also want to thank- Thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. And, and really from us, thank you for your historical perspective, your insight, your leadership. Uh, I'm sure I speak for all of everyone who attended that it was really enriching to hear all your stories. 
Um, we also want to thank the Women's Studies Advisory Council for their support of Patricia's research for the exhibit. And I want to thank my co-curators of the Founding Mothers exhibit, Patricia and Erica Castaño. Um, many thanks to our library colleagues, Kenya Johnson, Marty Taylor, and Maggie Verbally, who all made this event run smoothly, we believe. <laughs> Um, but also thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. We have, we'll uh, be adding links to the online exhibit in the chat. And um, the exhibit has even more amazing information and the oral histories that I mentioned earlier. So I hope all of you will get a chance to, to delve into it. Um, just as a reminder, the event has been recorded and it will be available soon on the exhibit site. So thanks again to everyone. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.